You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks, and today we have a special guest. It's Jordan Pridgen. Hi, everybody. Jordan's back because he upgraded the new Wilds of Eldraine uh, Virtue and Valor Precon. That name is not entirely clear, but what it is is a Selesnia Aura deck. It's green, it's white, it's full of enchantments, and it's based around the new uh, Wilds of Eldraine mechanic, Rolls. Uh, we'll talk about Rolls in a little bit, but they're super sweet. Uh, in this episode, we're going to go over the stats. We're going to break down what is in the box when you buy it off the shelf, and we're going to tell you what 10 cards to add and 10 cards to take out to get this deck in peak fighting shape as fast as possible. But before we do that, uh, we want to remind you that you can sp always support the show by using our affiliate links over at cardkingdom.com slash command. We're going to be talking about a lot of magic cards today and Card Kingdom has them. You can bet. They also have this sealed product for Wilds of Eldraine. If you're as excited about this set as I am, go over there, order the precons, order the set boosters, the collector boosters. The set is full of humor and weirdness uh, and like dark squishy mysteries I love it so much and Card Kingdom has a great selection of those magic cards so pre-order or order your sealed product over at cardkingdom.com slash command you can support the show and pick up a lot of sweet cards then once those cards are in your hand you're gonna need to protect them go to ultrapro.com slash command ultra pro has the best magic accessories in the business plus they have the licensed magic art which means that if you you are in love with some of the art in this set, which is awesome and spooky and cool. You got to go to Ultra Pro's website to check out what products that they have on play mats or sleeves, deck boxes, especially if spooky fairy tale is your vibe. Plus, you can support the show and all of the content that we make over here at the Command Zone by using that affiliate link. Once again, ultrapro.com slash command. The final way you can support us is directly go on over to patreon.com slash command zone. Patrons are supporting our content, truly making it better. They're paying the staff that makes this cool content. You guys make us better and stronger and a cooler, uh, cooler group for you. Uh, plus, you get cool perks where you get access to our content a day early, uh, specifically game nights and extra turns. So you get to watch those games before they've been spoiled. And you get access to exclusive content like Turn Talk, which is where we have a conversation about the game that just happened. Break down what we would have done if we'd drawn one more land a turn earlier and you hadn't and I could have. And if I had one more, it's those moments and it's really fun. Just like in actual games of Commander, yeah. pretty much every time you play. Where you're like, ah, yeah. that card really hmm. oh man i didn't expect this yeah it's a ton of fun and it's all of the personalities that you love at the command zone and all of the guests that we have as well uh and that's you can only get that by being a patron uh plus we shout out one lucky patron every single episode and this one is dedicated to nicole, nicole woods. woods thanks nicole you rock all right, let's get into it. Let's get into this new precon. It is the Virtue and Valor precon. Mm, very descriptive. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's because the the roles that she do, has are virtuous roles. Yeah, and, and you know what? I guess they I can't guess. call it like enchanting. Enchanted yeah. <laughs> every single time they do an enchantress set. You know. It's like it's, eventually you just have to use other words. Virtue and valor it is. Yeah, it'll do. <laughs> this is a super cool precon, and it's based around the roll mechanic. If you haven't uh, looked at it yet, rolls are token enchantment auras that get put on creatures, I suppose. And they all have different abilities. There's like the monster roll, which gives a plus one, plus one and trample. There's royal roll, which is a plus one, plus one and ward one. All of them have slightly different abilities, and uh, a creature can only have one roll uh, owned by a player at once. So, like, if I put a roll on a creature and I tried to put a second roll, I would pick which roll I keep. But if I had a roll on a creature and Jordan put a roll on that creature, it could wear those two rolls. Which is definitely important to keep in mind because I think that's that's yeah. a really easy thing to play wrong. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to get a lot of practice with rolls. It's in the main set as well, but this set is really built around them, so make sure this product is really built around them, so make sure that you understand that before playing it the first time. 
Uh, before we talk about upgrading this deck, let's talk about what's in the deck. What does it come with? Uh, starting with the lead singer of the deck, the face commander. So the face commander of this deck is Elevir of the Elevir Elevir of the Wild Court, uh, who is two. Green white for a 4 4 legendary creature, Human Knight. And whenever Elevir of the Wild Court enters the battlefield or attacks, create a virtuous roll token attached to another target creature you control. Um, and just to read the little reminder text here a virtuous roll is if you control another roll on it, put that one into the graveyard. And then Enchanted Creature gets plus, plus one, plus one for each enchantment you control. Okay. So that's a pretty powerful little roll. And then it says, whenever an enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Mm. Okay. So this is uh, clearly an um, enchantment commander. We want yep. as many enchantments in the deck as possible. Uh huh. It has both a payoff for having a ton of enchantments and card draw for having a ton of enchantments in the command zone. And it provides the enchantments. It provides more enchantments in self. Right. So. so it does. It is kind of doing everything that you want in yeah. an aura deck. When I think it's interesting, it, it feels like this is way more of a like like a go tall sort of thing than you often see with enchantments. Like. Right. It's it's like. What I like about Elevir is mm -hmm. normally when you do an aura deck, you're putting all of your auras onto your commander. Right. And you're attacking with that commander and you're, it's a Voltron strategy. Yeah. This wants you to go wider and then use individual, these individual, uh, their virtue roles, virtuous mm -hmm. roles to make sure that all of your creatures are big and, uh, and enchanted. Yeah. So it, it's both go tall and go wide. It's, it's very green. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because Elevir needs to attack herself, so you know you probably do want to put a certain amount of things on her. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting that she can't put the virtuous roll token on herself, right? Um, so you know you'll need to set her up some other way so that she can safely attack into people. But um, or put in a small blink package so that oh, you can yeah. reuse her ETB, right? Because you do just get it when she enters the battlefield. I, I, th I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting design on the commander. All right, we're going to talk about the backup commander, the second option in the deck. This one is Gilwain Casting Director. Uh, for one, a green and a white. This is a legendary human bard. He's a 2-3. And it says, whenever Gilwain Casting Director or another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. One, create a royal roll token attached to that creature. Two, create a sorcerer roll token attached to that creature. And three, create a monster roll token attached to that creature. So anytime a non-token creature enters the battlefield, you give him a roll like a casting director does. And in the art, he's got he's got a bunch of hats he's, he's got handing out. He's got a bunch out. of hats. <laughs> you know, we, we have lots of experience with casting directors. If you just show up, they give you a roll. Absolutely. That's what casting <laughs> That's directors easy. do. Come to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you haven't looked at the rolls yet, Royal Roll, like I mentioned before, it gives the creature plus one, plus one, and Ward one. Sorcerer Roll gives the creature plus one, plus one, and whenever it attacks, you scry one. And Monster Roll is, again, plus one, plus one, and Trample. I do think the biggest flavor fail of that card is it doesn't have any sort of cast triggers. That that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe all the creatures in in the deck have cast triggers. Sure, sure. <laughs> the Put cast. all that in there, and then the, the casting cast. See, yeah. If you build Gil Wayne, the ninety nine is the cast, and he's the director. Exactly. It's, it's all very good. Uh, so Gil Wayne is slightly different. This is less of an enchant commander and more of a creature commander yeah that incidentally makes a lot of enchantments which i mean it definitely makes it so it would be easy to just get the number of enchantments you have on the battlefield really high just right. by going wide with a lot of creatures worth noting that it's non-token so you can't yeah. make a ton of tokens and, and they don't enter with uh uh rolls on them that would go infinite with a lot of things um but it does sort of encourage you to have a really, really high creature count, but also enchantment payoffs, especially constellation payoffs, yep. because you're not necessarily casting a lot of enchantments unless you're leaning into enchantment creatures, uh, but you are going to have a lot of enchantments enter the battlefield. Yeah. Okay. So those are the new commanders that could be your commander of this. Overall, pre both of them are really cool. Really cool and a little bit different, but yeah. could both lead an aura deck pretty comfortably. Uh, before we choose which one we are going to put in the command zone, we're going to talk about what is inside this box, get to know the deck itself a little bit better, which means we've got to break down the stats. 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 Yeah. 
It says stats on the screen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or if it doesn't, somebody messed up. I don't know. They, they, the editors have it. I Put believe in them. stats on the screen, editors. Do it. <laughs> All right, we're going to break down what is in this deck, like the nuts and bolts, the vegetables that go in every single deck, just so we know how well it functions as a commander deck. Starting with this first category. First, there are 13 ramp cards in this deck. Okay. Uh, That feels very respectable to me. Yep. Uh, There are 13 card draw pieces. Also okay. great. I mean, it's Enchantress, so you expect card draw to be like a really heavy part of it. For sure. Um, and having Elevir in the command zone gives you a very strong 14th. Absolutely. Then there are four targeted interaction pieces. That wow. seems low. That seems very That's low. That's the lowest I've seen in a very long time for these decks. They've been getting up to like 11 lately, and four is quite low. Yeah. That's, so that's lower than I run, and I don't love to play a ton of interaction. I, I play a ton of interaction. I, yeah. I, I really like interaction. I would never be caught dead with only four targeted <laughs> interaction pieces in my deck. Okay. That being said, it does have three board wipes, um, which feels right. Yeah. I think three is generally what I like to run. In- I'm usually between two and three. Uh, definitely three if I'm less of a creature-y deck. If I'm, yeah. if I'm more aggressive, I sometimes two. If board wipes are likely to hurt you, maybe run a, a couple yeah. here. But three seems about right. Mm-hmm. Then there are 39 lands in the deck. <sighs> That's, That's a, a lot. lot of lands. That's a lot of lands. I run a lot of lands. I'm like, b- b- try and play a responsible land count. I don't like being mana screwed. I wouldn't run 39 lands unless there's like a maze of it in there. I know there's a lot of like dialogue in the community yeah. about how many lands you're supposed to run. I still tend to run around 37. And then if a deck is like particularly low on the curve, I'll, I'll cut it down mm-hmm. to 36 or 35 if I'm feeling really crazy. <laughs> but 39, um, especially with this much mini ramp pieces, feels maybe a little bit excessive. I, th- I think quite high, especially considering there are 29 basic lands in this deck. Yep. That is... Um, th- doesn't give you a ton of fixing. Uh, that means there's only 10 non-basic lands in this deck. Luckily, it is just two color. So That's true. You're not likely to stumble over uh, colors too, too much, but uh, whoosh. Okay, 39 lands. Then there are 28 enchantments in the deck. Yeah, we we like to separate breaking down the vegetables in the deck and then the categories that make this deck special. So what we what are make the enchantress get, yeah. deck go and twenty eight enchantments is a little low. Yeah, it, it's it's about right, but a little low. Like I I know the number that I I yeah. tend to hear tossed around when we talk about like this thing matters is like thirty. Yeah, it's like. We tend to say between 25 and 30 if we're like really relying on that thing. But I feel like Enchantress decks always have a really high density of enchantments because they tend to play a little bit like Storm decks where where you you cast an enchantment, draw. Cast an enchantment, draw a card. Cast an enchantment, draw a card. Cast an enchantment, make five mana, draw a card. Like stuff like that. So it rings true probably because we're a more aura deck that we do have to have more creatures in the deck uh, for Gilwain and the like. But. Well, and honestly, if if you are, you know, working on upgrading this deck yourself, uh, a good way to, if you're especially kind of new to putting together decks, is look at things that aren't enchantments and look at them and see if there's an enchantment that can do something similar and mm-hmm. increase the thing. So, you know, it gives you somewhere to build mm-hmm. boards. Um, 22 speak- of those enchantments are, are auras. auras. Yeah. That's a ton of auras. It's an aura deck. That's what we're doing, uh, which makes sense because a lot of the card draw is specifically aura based, not necessarily general enchantment stuff. Yeah. Although there are some enchantresses as well. Yeah. Um, and auras, you know, are a, a bit of a double edged sword. Mm. Like they are interesting and they can make your creatures go a bit bigger, but they they are a, a little less stable than normal enchantments because they can tend to be removed by removing the creature that they've been put on. Right. They um, set you up for two for ones where your opponent can use one removal spell and yep. take care of both the aura and the creature, which is not how you win commander games. Yeah. But as long as you kind of keep that in mind, you can build it around it and mm-hmm. hopefully it'll work out. Uh, but then there are nine enchantment payoffs in the deck, which okay. are things that will, you know, generate mana or draw you cards if you are playing enchantments or give you some other bonus uh, going on. Mm-hmm. 13 aura payoffs. Yeah, so these are split into two categories where there's a lot of cards in the deck that are specifically pay you off for casting auras or having auras, and then there are more general ones that care about enchantments. So you can look at this as like, there are 22 payoffs in the deck for enchantments and auras, but this deck clearly tips towards aura specific. Yes. And then finally, the last uh, category we threw in there was eight recursion pieces, which I I think is pretty important for an auras deck specifically. Absolutely. 
Because, it, as we said, you're going to get your creatures removed and your auras are going to end up in the graveyard. And it, you really want to be able to bring them back, get more uses out of them, either get them back to your hand so you can cast them again or get them right back onto the battlefield so that you can, you know, start hitting people with them again. Absolutely. I really like this number and I love using the graveyard, especially when I'm playing white. Definitely. So uh, eight recursion pieces goes a long way. All right. Having looked at the stats, having broken down the categories, uh, what commander do you think suits this deck best? So I think you could probably run either of them and mm -hmm. have it run pretty well. But I thought Elevir of the Wild Court was out of the box going to be the better one to run and would be a, a, an interesting one to build around, too. I I like the choice of Elevir. And yeah. I, I think specifically because there are 22 auras in this deck mm -hmm. and those don't really have anything to do with Gilwain. Right. Where Gilwain wants you to cast non-token creatures and that means, you know, their auras are good when your stuff has trample or perhaps ward. Definitely. But they don't necessarily make more rolls, which is what your casting director really wants. So yeah. Elevir really works with this high enchantment count, uh, especially that high aura count. Yep. And I think Gawain's super cool to build around. I just think it would probably take a couple more changes to the deck than just the 10 we're trying to do to really make it a Gilwain deck, you yeah. know? Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about what is in this deck financially now that we've talked about it uh, mechanically. Uh, we want to make sure that if you pick up this product that you know exactly what you're buying and you're getting all of your money back for it. Uh, so we're going to talk about the reprint value. This takes into account uh, just the value of the reprints. We don't have the value of the new cards, of course, uh, which includes 60 cards. Um in the 99 if you take away the new cards the like the new cards just for this and then the main set cards and the basics uh so only 60 cards being included in this price of course all of these prices were taken uh before this deck was spoiled so the prices aren't necessarily going to be reflective once the list comes out uh the number will go down but we're going to compare it to precons that have been taken at the same time so the numbers are still representative all of those uh, caveats out of the way. Let's talk about what the total reprint value of this deck is. So the reprint value for this deck is $118.39. Wow. That's pretty good. $118 is, is quite high for yeah. what we've seen. And That's these, very up there. And these deck, it's hard to know exactly what the price of these are without MSRP, but these are selling for about $40, which is about what precons go for uh, in, in like sets that, that go with standard sets in the past. So $118 for a $40 deck is very exciting, especially when you compare it to uh, other precons of the past that were about $40. Baldur's Gate precons average reprint value was about $104, and we were very happy with those decks. Yeah. Uh, Brothers War precons were average reprint value was about $95. Which is oh. dipping a a little bit under yeah. what you know we tend to like but the all will be one precons average reprint value is about 101 dollars mm -hmm. over 100 dollars again we were usually pretty happy with that march of the machine precons average about 97 dollars we're talking like 15 to 25 dollars more than those averages yeah th that's a nice little bump up and, and you know, I guess we can look uh, when we go into the actual cards they do, whether that's all like kind of in one or two value cards mm -hmm. or if it's just sort of over the whole thing. But it feels like a nice, valuable deck. Absolutely. And Enchantress decks are so expensive because they're so popular. So having yeah. a precon that has that value in it and will get you a lot of the pieces goes a long way. Uh, what I have been starting to do with these reprint values is break them down into like bang for your buck quotients. Yeah. Because MSRP makes it so difficult to compare things directly, I've been taking roughly what they've been going for and... Um, the reprint value. So I'll take the reprint value, which in this case was $118.39, and I'll divide it by the assumed price, which is about $40, which means that for every $1 you spend in like American money, <laughs> you get $2.96 
cents worth of cards. That's pretty good. That's Probably almost one dollar you spend, you get three dollars in an actual card value, which is great, especially when you're looking back on these other average reprint values. The the bang for your buck in Baldur's Gate was two dollars and sixty cents. $2.38 in Brothers War, $2.50 in All Will Be One, and $2.40 in March of the Machines. So we're getting an, almost an additional $0.50 cents per card. R- really nice just putting per, some per like, dollar, value into me. this. Especially, you know, since it's supposed to be kind of a newer player entry yeah. sort of product. Happy to see it, especially after the Commander Masters precon, which Definitely. were uh, very disappointing value-wise. All right, so let's talk about the individual notable reprints in this deck. The cards that we're excited to see reprinted, we're just going to talk about the ones over $5. And the first one is a doozy. Hall of Heliod's Generosity. Yeah, this one's coming in at $13. Great recursive piece for any enchantment deck. So nice. Just like easy. It's a land that comes into play untapped, and then you can basically get your enchantments back when you need it later. So low cost to run in the deck, like as far as uh, actual slots in Mm -hmm. the deck. And nice that you just get it for buying this one. Yeah, Bear Umbra is the next one. It coming in at eight dollars. Very powerful Super aura. Powerful. Glad to see it reprinted. This next one's great as well. It's Umbra Mystic. Umbra Mystic gives every uh, uh, auras attached to permanents you control have totem armor, and totem armor basically means when they die, instead you just remove that aura and they come back to life, which is is an enormous upside. Yeah, that takes that two-for-one removal spell and turns it into a one-for-one, which is a huge deal. And yeah. especially in this deck where a lot of your auras are tokens, Yep, that means that it, basically everything has an added layer of protection and you haven't spent full cards to get it. Really, really Really nice. powerful in this deck. Uh, the next one is a boggle staple. It's Daybreak Coronet. Uh, this is an aura. It's very powerful. Uh, it adds a big buff. Then we have uh, Retether. Nice. Which is uh, just a very powerful um, recursion spell going on there. And it's a $6 card getting a reprint here. The next one is Mantle of the Ancients, also at $6. This one returns any number of auras or equipment from your graveyard to the battlefield. Again, Retether, Mantle of the Ancients, Umbra Mystic. These are all expensive because they're powerful and necessary in aura decks. And finally, we have Utopia Sprawl, which was at $5.50. I hadn't realized it kind of had gotten that expensive, but it makes sense. Getting another reprint on this card is really, really important. It goes in every single enchantment deck that's the best way to ramp when you're casting uh honestly in uh, yeah, a lot of decks. green decks one mana to ramp it, that, that'll do ya. yeah yeah uh, utopia is probably really really good and nice to see it reprinted at yeah. five dollars and fifty cents let's move on to the whoop best cards in the deck we've talked about the most expensive ones but that that's not necessarily the best cards uh so we're going to talk about the ones that when they're in your hand you're like all right the deck is moving well now. yes Let's, um, what's this first one so the first one we had in here is a uh, satessan champion and i think it's kind of worth saying that anything that's just like aura etb draw a card is going to be a really great thing to have in hand there's a couple of these it's like satessan champion and eidolon of blossoms and the new one tangle span lookout it's a little satyr that says whenever an aura enters the battlefield draw a card all of those Great. Very yeah. excited to see them. Really good. And, and I mean, ones like Satessan Champion specifically kind of does the whole thing because it's going to be getting bigger as it goes on too. This one's whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1-1 counter on Satessan Champion and draw a card. You're just going to be going great. That's going to trigger off your rolls, which is real nice. Mm-hmm. The next really great card we had in here was Sanctum Weaver. It's one of the best cards in any Enchantress deck, especially one where you're making a lot of tokens. It seems really powerful. Absolutely great. And uh, that card is one in a green for a zero two. And it just says tap to add X mana of any one color where X is the number of enchantments you control. And it is itself an enchantment creature dryad. So worst case scenario, you play it for two and it taps for one and it will tap for a lot more very fast. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this next one we have already talked about, but it's Umbra Mystic. Or as attached to permanence you control have, Totem Armor. Really A good. lot of protection. Really, it's like free in this deck, especially if you choose Gilwain as your commander. But even when you have Elevir, when she comes in or when she attacks, puts Totem Armor on something. Pr- pretty enormous. essential for an Aura's deck. Really. Absolutely. This last one is one I, I really love. I don't know if we, we do the numbers, if it's really all that powerful. But. But I love it. Look at his <laughs> little face. It's called Knickknack 
oof. Already the, already deserves to be on the list. It's an oof. It has knickknack in its name, and it costs X and a green for a 1-1. One, one. And then knickknack oof enters the battlefield with X 1-1 one, one counters on it. So it's, it's basically like a hydra oof kind of thing. Hydra oof a is hydra oof. haunting, Jordan. <laughs> yes. Imagine how many little <laughs> Long oof Long necks with oof heads on the end. I Oofing hate it. Oofing all over the place. <laughs> Um, but it, then, here's the thing that I think makes it cool. Uh, when Knickknack Oof enters the battlefield, reveal the top X cards of your library. You may put any number of aura cards with mana value X or less from among them into the battlefield. Then put all cards revealed this way that weren't put into the battlefield from the bottom of your library on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, yeah. this is like Genesis Oof. It's Genesis <laughs> Oof. We did mention that there are 22 auras in this deck uh, when it starts. So it's like every fifth card roughly is an aura. So you do want X to be big with this oof. You want X to be 10. But if you've got your Sanctum Weaver out there and you already have a bit of a board. That's true. You could play this oof and then just bam, have a whole bunch of auras enter the battlefield, pop them all onto your best beater. Get in there. Oof. All right. That's a big <laughs> oof. That's an oof from me, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best cards in the deck. We talked about what's in this box, what we like about it, and we're going to upgrade it in just a few minutes. But first, a few words from our sponsors. Mint Mobile presents the tale of Garrick, the cursed huntsman. Garrick was once a noble collar of beasts until his will was twisted by big wireless contracts. Ah, another bill full of overage charges and surprise fees? That makes me so mad I could just kill my former allies. Oh, hi, Garrick. Ah. So Garrick wandered the plains, too strapped for cash to call his beast. Until a simple squirrel showed him a podcast ad for Mint Mobile. What? Only 15 bucks a month for unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network? Plus, I can keep my phone and all my contacts? <laughs> <clears throat> With Mint Mobile, I shall axe my accursed big wireless contract and be free to call the beast once more. Hello? Is this beasts? Yeah, I got a new plan that a squirrel showed me. Hold on, let me put you on wild speaker. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. What's up, Josh? Rachel, oh, thank God. I need your help. I think I'm stuck in a time loop. What? Oh, hiring is a nightmare. Every day I wake up and I spend hours browsing job sites and searching through resumes, but it's all the same. I'm getting nowhere. That's not a time loop, Josh. That's just you not using Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple sites, Indeed lets you attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You'll find top talent fast with powerful tools like Instant Match. Whoa, Indeed's hiring platform is great. I literally just sponsored this job post and I already have a short list of qualified candidates. It's like Indeed did all the work for me. See? Wait, so... I'm really not in a time loop? No. Oh. Oh, God. What did you do, Josh? What did you do? Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash command zone. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash command zone. Just go to Indeed.com slash command zone and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Again, that's Indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. And then I'm gonna flash out a Lucio Ambusher. I will bolt it to draw three cards. I will sneak attack out Triska Decafile. I'm gonna go to my upkeep and I will win the game. That was your first time playing the deck? Yeah. Well, I mean, first time in paper. I've already goldfished it like a hundred times on Architect. Their play tester is super user friendly. Playing cards just takes one click and you can mulligan, tutor, and move through your turns with the press of a key. There are simple menus with counters and copies and you can take notes on cards as you play them. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and play test commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. We are upgrading the Virtue and Valor precon from the new Wilds of Eldraine. This is a green-white auras, and it is time to take 10 cards out of the deck and add 10 new ones to get this deck in fighting shape. But before we get into the exact cards that we're adding, I want to talk about the deck as it stands and what you were trying to do with these upgrades. So I, I think kind of because we're kind of aiming for this enchantment sort of stompy deck, one of the biggest things we wanted to deal with was 
Um, one, getting creatures on the board, getting more enchantment payoffs when those virtuous rolls are entering the battlefield, and um, and providing some level of evasion or ability that makes it so you can either blink or attack with Elevir and more consistently get those uh, enchantments on the battlefield. Right, because naturally she's she's a 4-4 on the ground with no evasion, can't put a roll on herself. So it is hard to get her going without a blink or some other kind of evasion. Uh, I know we also talked about that the removal in this deck is quite low. Yeah, so we tried to add a, a little bit stronger removal. I, I would say if you're doing a full upgrade yourself, you probably want to overhaul it a little bit more because mm-hmm. we didn't feel like if, if it was up to me, I would put like five of the slots in removal. It just <laughs> immediately take two card, two lands out and add in two, yeah. two removal spells. Um, I, I didn't want to do that for this because it just seems like a little more a dull like mm-hmm. way to do the upgrade. We wanted to work on things that kind of synergize with the commander a little more directly. Yeah. But there is a lot of room for adding... Um, removal and we tried to add a couple that will synergize yeah. in their own way all right let's get into it we are going to start with some very synergistic cards that really just maximize elevir's power here what's this first one the first one i wanted to add was calyx guided by fate calyx maybe um calyx is one green and a white for a 2-2 legendary enchantment creature human druid and he has constellation which we mentioned is really good uh, basically whenever calyx guided by fate or another enchantment enters the battlefield under your control put a 1-1 counter on target creature so that's nice that's just going to kind of keep your board growing and but it's doing what you want already which is turning enchantments into power right Exactly. And then whenever Calyx or another enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player, another thing you already want to be doing, you may create a token that's a copy of a non-legendary enchantment you control. Do this only once each turn. So you already have aura, like, uh, enchanted creatures. Yep. You already have auras on creatures, which means, and you're already trying to hit with them. So Calyx is just incidental doubling of your enchantments. Which is huge. The, the floor on this in this deck is basically that Elevir is creating those virtuous tokens and you put those around. And that's mm-hmm. still a great enchantment to be doubling, to be right. adding more. This is also a way to potentially put that virtuous roll on Elevir because she can't put it on herself. But if you make a copy of it, you can put it on whoever you want. Yeah. Um, so you can make her big and that makes it easier to attack with her and keep running those out. Yeah, Calyx seems great in this deck, and it goes really well with this next card, which is Kodama of the West Tree. <sighs> this card's cracked. Uh, two and a green <laughs> for a legendary creature spirit is a 3-3 three, three with reach. And he says, modified creatures you control have trample. Enormous. Uh, modified for those who didn't play during Neo or don't remember are equipped... Equipment, auras you control, and counters are all modifications. So any creatures with counters on them, any creatures with auras on them, or any equipped creatures are all modified creatures and now have trample. So Kodama themselves is great to modify, and all of your other creatures that are now buffed by your commander are have trample. Yes. If if that was the only line on the creature, it would be worth running. And it keeps going. It (laughs) says, whenever a modified creature you control deals combat damage to a player, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. Just amazing no limitation on this one by the way not only once per turn like calyx <laughs> if, if you have elvir out and you are making all these big virtuous creatures which suddenly all have trample and every time they deal damage to an opponent you are drawing a card and searching a land from your library onto the battlefield huge swing really really powerful in this deck and honestly feels like one of the most must adds absolutely uh all right uh this next one is sweet as well this is skybind which is three white white for an enchantment and it says whenever skybind or another enchantment enters the battlefield under your control exile target non-enchantment permanent return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next instep uh, this is really versatile. The yeah. the reason that we've put it into the deck is it's a neat way to be able to blink Elevir. Over and over, and it's every turn. Yeah. So Elevir enters the battlefield. She puts a virtuous roll on a creature. Mm-hmm. 
That triggers Skybind, which will exile Elevir again until the next end step when she comes back <laughs> and puts a virtuous role on something else. You can just kind of keep this going. Like, this is its own built-in engine with Elevir. Yeah. Also, if you need to remove something so that you can, you know, run in and hit them for the turn, great to be able to get rid of it for just a little moment. But I, I think it just kind of does everything here. It's really a cool spot for Skybind, and it's a great way to keep your commander turning out problems and and sort of keeping your commander safe yeah all right this next one is super sweet uh i talked about it recently in a, on an episode with garav uh it's one with the kami three and a green for an enchantment aura with flash it says enchant creature you control whenever enchanted creature or another modified creature you control dies create x one one colorless spirit creature tokens where x is that creature's Power. This is my favorite ad. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's an aura that you can cast at flash speed. Yep. That anytime one of your big enchanted creatures dies, you just explode into a bunch of tiny little one ones. When you have this, you can seriously overcommit to the board. Yeah. Because if, I mean, all these virtuous rolls are going to be making your creatures huge. Mm -hmm. If someone wipes the board and you respond with one with the Kami, you're going to win the game. <laughs> That's too many one ones. Okay, now, but you've got Calyx on the board, and Calyx is attacking, and Calyx is making one with the Kami oh copies. My. Now, all of the one with the Kamis see each other and make twice as many one ones. Ah! <laughs> Sounds like a mess. And it it's not a awesome. Fun. All of the cards with modified on them are really, really good in a deck that can repeatedly and sort of freely modify your creatures. Yeah. This next one is a classic, but is a great card draw engine for any aura deck. It's SRAM, Senior Edificer. One in a white for a legendary creature, dwarf advisor. Whenever you cast an aura, equipment, or vehicle spell, draw a card. Now, it is cast, so it's it's not going to get you something off of all the rolls that enter the battlefield. But, you know, we have a ton of aura spells in the deck, so... It's just a great little two mana card that will probably draw you a ton of cards over the course of the game. Yeah, and it's important having creatures in this deck. Absolutely. Because you do need something to put the rolls on. Yep. So next we went into um, what we th thing we mentioned earlier, which is upping the removal count mm -hmm. in the deck a little bit. Um, this first one is uh, just one of my favorite green removal pieces and very, very effective, which is Song of the Dryads. Uh, this is two and a green for an enchantment aura, and it's enchant permanent. Enchanted permanent is a colorless forest land. Yeah, Song of the Dryads is all the way down to $4. This was an expensive card for a while, but it's been reprinted enough that it is affordable and will trigger all of your aura things and it was really great to copy and it's just gonna handle it it gets rid of things sometimes for good yeah <laughs> <laughs> like uh, some people get mad at me for this but i love casting this on my opponent's commanders because <laughs> figure it out <laughs> it can just shut their deck off a lot of people don't have good ways to remove song of the dryads and that does not let you put it back in your command zone and cast it again Speaking of, this next one does the same thing. It's Dark Steel Mutation. Oh Turn boy. their commander into a 0 1 indestructible bug. It's an aura, so it's going to be easy to search for if you add those tutors to the deck. Plus, it triggers all of your enchantresses and all of your aura enchantresses specifically. Now, it does give a, uh, a, a solid little blocker for yeah. your opponent. Don't put so, it on anything with counters. <laughs> there is the other way to play Dark Steel Mutation in this deck, That's which true. is to cast it on one of your creatures to make an indestructible bug, and then you can put the virtuous token on it, mm. and you have a huge indestructible <laughs> beater. That's, nobody, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> nobody sees the your own side dark steel mutation move coming, but it can it can get you there. I love it. Uh, this last one is one of the best removal spells on an enchantment. It's Grasp of Fate. One white white for an inst uh, enchantment. Excuse me. One white white for an enchantment. When Grasp of Fate enters the battlefield for each opponent, exile up to one target non-land permanent that player controls until Grasp of Fate leaves the battlefield. Really good. The thing about Grasp of Fate is you pin opponent's stuff underneath it, and they want to remove it. Because they, their stuff is under it. Yeah. So if they remove it, 
two opponents get their problem things back. Exactly. Like, like if we played in a game and, and someone else has like coma or yeah. something and I play it and I get rid of coma and something you like, mm-hmm. you're not going to destroy that coma. enchantment. coma. Like, no. <laughs> you're like, I don't have a plan for coma. I guess I just lose that thing. Fate uh, says they're all grasped together. <laughs> That's and grass with fate works. after uh, the reprint is at four dollars. Yeah, a great little pick up there. Um, so next, these are pieces that uh, we put into the evasion category. I, I really like this one. I, I think this works on a lot of levels. It's flickering ward, which is just one white for uh, an enchantment aura. It says enchant creature here because it's an old card. Uh, when you play flickering ward, choose a color. Enchanted creature gains protection from the chosen color. And then here's the part that really makes it cool. For one white, you can return Flickering Ward to its owner's hand, which means you can cast it again over and over again. Mm-hmm. Like you might just on a single turn cast Flickering Aura, bounce it to your hand, cast Flickering Aura to be drawing cards over and over again in the whole thing. But it also is a great way to put protection on your commander so that you can roll in and get those auras on people, get those cards from your opponents and stuff. So I think this kind of does everything here. Love Flickering Ward in these kind of decks. Any deck with SRAM or that cares about auras, like you could put this on your commander to get another attack from her. You could put it on one of the big things to be like, oh, you yep. thought you could block. <laughs> Oh no. You can't. You can't. Uh, Flickering Ward is a little spendy at $6.50, but worth it. Absolutely. One more big evasion piece here uh, and a classic. It is Hollowed Haunting. Uh, two white white for an enchantment as long as you control seven or more enchantments creatures you control have flying and vigilance oh no yep <laughs> then whenever you cast an enchantment spell create a white spirit cleric creature token with this p- creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of spirits you control so anytime you cast an enchantment you make a spirit those spirits are getting bigger also they have flying and vigilance uh, as does your commander and all of your big scary things yeah this is a board in a box in this deck like it, it when you have yeah when you have all of those auras and you're like i don't have any creatures mm-hmm. uh hollowed haunting creates those creatures for you uh it is worth noting that you can't cast the aura make a spirit and then enchant that spirit you have to have a target when you cast the aura yes but if you have your commander or another creature on board you can cast the aura targeting that creature then you make a spirit token well and obviously future auras you know it'll be providing well, yeah. new things you can put it on it's, there you go it's the bomb being able to not overcommit in this deck is going to be essential. And having as many of those cards that say whenever you cast or whenever it enters, uh, whenever you cast an enchantment or whenever an enchantment enters, make a thing. Um, it's going to go a long way. And impressively, there's already a bunch that were already in the deck. But, yes. but it just felt good to add at least one more. Flying and Vigilance. Yeah. Uh-oh. So... We, this is our first Exaxes budget. We but got there. With the Hollowed Haunting <laughs> is at $9, and the total is $50 spent to upgrade this one. Uh, we kind of nailed it. Really, really nailed it on, <laughs> on this one. And we got some really cool cards in there. Uh, Calyx and Kodama, one with the Kami, uh, add a bumping up that removal suite. All super important. Yeah. But of course, we have added 10 cool cards, which means we have to take 10 cards out of this deck. Um, and some were easier to remove than others. Uh, this first one <laughs> was easy. Yeah. I- Tithe Taker, uh, which just... It like, like is a stacks piece it and like taxes your opponent on your turn and then when it dies it makes a spirit and you're like i guess that's two bodies and a little bit of protection but it has nothing to do with auras and it's really not complete protection it's not an enchantment i don't like it take it out get it out of here uh this next one was hard to cut based on the art alone yes it's liberated livestock let's um, read this one because it's new yeah and so this is five and a white for a creature cat bird ox four six yep crazy creature type and Cat, then, comma, bird, comma, ox. And you, you can see them. They're, they're all there together. Playing. Fighting or playing. I or, think they're playing. Uh, I think that ox would absolutely smash that cat. I don't know. That cat's got the claws out, I think. Either way. They're having fun. When liberated livestock dies, create a 1-1 one, one white cat creature token with lifelink, a 1-1 one, one white bird creature token with flying, and a 2-4 white ox creature token. For each of those tokens, you may put an aura card from your hand and or graveyard into the battlefield attached to it neat it is neat the problem with liberated livestock is 
we don't have a way to make it die. Yeah. And it's like paying a six mana for a four six that we cannot reliably kill. Not very good. It doesn't have trample. It doesn't have like, it has a great dies trigger in this deck, but mm-hmm. we just aren't in control of it. It would be like if you put a big aura on it and they just path it. You're yeah. Like, great. I spent six mana on a vanilla creature. I, I could see there being some spicy combos in a deck that is more about, you know, being able to recur this creature and consistently get a ton of things back. But the if you've played with creatures that you're just hoping are big creatures and will die and give you value, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, games. it's there's too many bounce removal spells. There's too many exile removal spells. You really need a sack outlet or a couple of sack outlets to reliably yeah. trigger dry, dies triggers when you want it to. Um, so yeah, li- liberated livestock got the axe, unfortunately, along with the second one, which is Ox Drover. Uh, This is a new one as well. It's three and a white for a creature human peasant. It's a four, four with vigilance. Ox Drover can't be blocked by oxen. Sure. And whenever Ox Drover enters the battlefield or attacks, target opponent creates a two, four white ox creature token and you draw a card. This is neat. It is so neat. And yeah. it's so unrelated to anything no. that's going on I mean, in the deck. It draws cards, which is something all decks sort of need, but it also creates pretty serious blockers for your opponents. Yeah, two fours are hefty. And it doesn't that's say body. your creatures can't be blocked by oxen. No. It says ox drover can't be blocked by oxen. So uh, the oxen can block Elevir, the yeah. oxen can block any the number oxen of things. Block Elevir. Well, I not mean, not, they, they can't four, productively, four. Yeah. but I mean, you give them two oxen. Now, and now it's not produ- yeah. anymore. Yeah, it's, um, there's better ways to draw cards than Enchantress, believe it or not. Yeah. I hope there's a cool, cool deck for Ox Drover someday. I don't think this is the one. The next one we're taking out is Sylvan Ranger. Um, This is just not a particularly great card draw piece. There's not a lot to say about it. Yep. You don't need more card draw, especially not a single use one. Uh, Not an enchantment. Next one is from the main set. It's Sir Armand the Redeemer. Three green and a white for a human knight. Four, four. When Sir Armand... Sir Armont enters the battlefield, create a monster roll token attached to another target creature you control. Enchanted creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Um, this is a five drop. Yeah. And it makes a monster roll, which is just worse than the rolls we're handing out. And will knock the rolls off of yeah. the creatures you do. And you, you can't combine that trample of the monster roll with the virtuous roll. It's one or the other. The ETB isn't strong enough. You can't even put the monster yeah. token on Sir Armand herself. And the buff is just too small. We're, yeah. we're going bigger than that. She, so she's for five mana. too expensive anthem. Not enough. Out. Up next, we had Timber Paladin, which I believe is another new one. Timber Paladin is just a weird card. It's an artifact creature, so it's not an enchantment itself. And then if you put three enchantments on it, it becomes a pretty serious beater. Yeah, but that is all of your eggs in one weird Timber Paladin basket. Yeah, it's a lot. There's better things to put it on. Honestly, just like, you know, putting stuff on tokens so you can go wide and and minimize the amount that people get when they have removal is probably a better move. For sure. This is not a stack all your auras on one thing deck. This is a stack all your auras on a lot of things. Overwhelm them deck. Uh, this next one is sort of shocker. It's removal. Uh, it's not very good, though. It's yeah. Warbriar Blessing. Um, when an ETB's enchanted creature fights up to one target creature, you don't control. Uh, and then it has a very small toughness buff. The thing about this aura is it requires a lot of things to be going right. When you it's sorcery speed, you have to have a creature that can kill the problem creature. You have to have, like, probably already have an aura, like a, a virtuous aura on it. This card screams blowout to me. Yeah, it just feels extreme. Yeah, if they remove the virtuous roll in response to the fight, you then, lose the then fight. you just Die. lose the fight. It seems really really finicky and we've added much stronger removal yeah i hate taking removal out when it's already low but this is not a removal piece yeah very slow this is a trap trap all right um next up we took out daybreak coronet um this card is okay uh the biggest downside to daybreak coronet is it says enchant creature with another aura attached to it so it's just going to be not great in a lot of situations. And it does give a creature 3-3 three, three and First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink, which are all really nice. They're all good keywords, but the keyword we want is Flying or Trample yes. or Menace. Like, we want Evasion, 
primarily like yeah, this, something that'll help them get through your stuff is already big uh yeah. you really want to make sure that that damage connects and the lifeline doesn't quite do enough uh speaking of just not quite doing enough the next one is giant inheritance which is four and a green and basically is an enchantment aura that gives a creature five five and when it attacks creates a monster roll token attached to up on ta target attacking creature so it can put it on itself so it can give the thing uh trample but again it doesn't work with the virtuous rolls yeah we just doing. i think we just want elevir to put more rolls on stuff yeah um, and you have to be really careful about the balance in aura decks. You want to make sure that you have enough creatures in the deck for the cool auras that you're putting in the deck. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't cutting a ton of creatures and, um, it, we're trying to maintain a solid creature count for the auras and that meant cutting some of the cool auras. Yeah. Oh, and I, I guess it is worth saying the giant inheritance will come back to your hand when it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield. But, you know, being able to cast a five mana enchantment every turn is, is just not a very efficient thing. Five mana for an aura makes me really nervous. Yeah, That's, absolutely. It's just a uh, uh, tough way to spend your mana. Mm -hmm. uh, this last one is a forest. Yeah, we cut a forest. 39 is too many. Yeah, it's Get rid it's of a many. forest. I know we normally say we don't touch the mana base on We're the touching end, that forest. It's too many. And I'll throw it out there. If you really love one of those cards we cut and you just can't part with it... Cut you, another forest. You can it's cut okay. one more land. It's okay. It's okay. Don't, don't tell the commander community <laughs> we told you this. But you can cut a land. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So we've added 10 cool new cards to the deck. We've taken 10 out. How is the deck going to play post-upgrade? So I think that this deck is going to be all about snowballing, mm. which is something that you will be very familiar with if you've seen Enchantress decks kind of playing. But this is sort of an, a stompy Enchantress deck. Um, I think you don't want Elevir to be the first creature on the board, so it's not going to be like a lot of decks where you just race to casting your commander as the first thing. But you do probably want to get her out early so that you can start kind of a attacking and connecting before your opponents make a board that's going to be able to block stuff so you can get some card advantage going. Um, once you kind of have a few evasive creatures with rolls on them, every card you play is going to be making your board bigger. It's going to be drawing you more cards and making you do more damage, and it's going to increase very quickly. So you'll probably draw um, a lot of removal to Elevir herself. Like, she is going to get hate, and and each virtuous creature, because they're all going to be threats. So you want to make sure you're spreading your R's out across the board. This is not Voltron. You do not want to be adding everything on the same creature. Um, it can be really nice to play auras on token creatures so that if they are removed, you really are only losing one card in that exchange, the mm -hmm. aura that was on them, really, compared to it. Uh, late game, board wipes are going to set you back a lot, but there is a ton of recursion in the deck. Uh, which is pretty nice. I think that's really important to an or enchantments thing just to, uh, you're going to want to save those yeah. until you're in a dire situation and you need to pull everything back onto the board and surprise people and, and take them out. Definitely maximize that recursion. Don't spend it on, on something unless it is you really, really need it. If you're out of cards, if you have no board, uh, you really want to explode uh, post board wipe yep. because people think they're safe and they're not. This is not your daddy's dirtily enchantress deck. No. This is not, this is not ghostly prison deck. This is smash, it, it, uh, which is sweet. I like it because yeah. I've seen a lot of games with enchantment decks where they go, play a card, draw a card, play a card, draw a card, man, I've got my whole deck in an enormous board. Pass. Pass. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah, so I have a lot, and I'm really scary, but I don't have anything. There Elevir will be is not that way. No <laughs> question of how you win with Elevir. You will win because you will have 2020s all over your board. Yeah, and they're coming uh, with Trample and your drawing cards. Oh, Lord. Seems. They oh, Lord. <laughs> they come. You put them on mice tokens. The smaller the token, yep. the big. It's pretty sweet. All right. Uh, to the listeners, what do you think of the Virtue and Valor pre-con? Any cards we missed that have to go in this 99? Any cards we suggested to take out or add that you disagree with? L let us know in the comments. It's always fun to see how you guys are building this deck and uh, if you are as excited as we are. Uh, if you 
saw some cards that you like today go to cardkingdom.com slash command we talked about a lot of cards you can get them at card kingdom they have these like wide selection of cards that you're looking for but also you can order them all in one place so that they ship in one package safely to you so if you're upgrading elevator you can order all 10 cards ship them to you put them in sleeves and now you're ready to play you could order these 10 cards with the pre-com Seems great. Again, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. You can support the show, support this podcast, uh, and pick up some cool new Wilds of Eldraine cards. Uh, And once those cards in your hand, you're going to need to sleeve them up. Put them in a deck box. You're going to need new magic accessories, and you can get those over at ultrapro.com slash command. I never have enough sleeves. I never have enough (laughs) deck boxes. I'm always outbuilding the stuff that I have. So every so often, I'll go to Ultra Pro, and I will just order a mess of deck boxes and sleeves so that when inspiration strikes, I am ready. Plus, they have high-quality stuff, so I know that my decks are always going to be safe. I know that they're good to travel. I know that they're clearly marked. Um, Uh, And you can get all of those over at Ultra Pro. If you want to buy a bunch of deck boxes and stuff like I do all at once, make sure that you are signed up for the Ultra Pro newsletter because they always announce new sales or when they get new product in. And it's just the best way to make sure that you are spending your money wisely. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you can support the show and support the safety of your cards and collection over at ultrapro.com slash command. Okay, we've talked a lot about magic. Yep. Uh, let's talk about something outside of the world of magic. Is there anything that has your fancy right now? Uh, well, I mean, the whole world, and I mean, this will be coming out a little yeah. bit in the future, has been playing Baldur's Gate 3. Yes. And I am one of them. Yep. It uh, seems sweet. I was just talking to people in my D&D group about it yesterday. If you play D&D, yeah. you've got to play Baldur's Gate. There's a lot of familiar names from the Baldur's Gate set. It, from uh, Commander Legends Baldur's Gate. One of the coolest things playing through it, and I played through it a bit when it was in early access, Yeah. but you know, you do know all these characters from the Baldur's Gate set that kind of came out and you're like, well, I don't know who that is, but I get it. I don't normally know who people are in right. Magic when yeah. it comes out. But every time you interact with them, and I, you know, I'll run into Will, and he's like, I'm the Blade of the Frontiers. And I'm like, you're like you are. <laughs> you <laughs> double dice roll. Oh, wow. He's like, <laughs> let's go kill Karlak. And I'm like, I know that I know one Karlak. <laughs> <laughs> Asterian. Wow. I love that guy. <laughs> or hate that guy. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, go play Baldur's Gate 3. It, it's really fun. And then maybe, you know, go back, look at the Baldur's Gate cards and, and build a deck around your favorite character. That's cool. With a neat little background or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I uh, You're playing on multiplayer mode, yeah? Yes. Me and... Um, some of my friends from back home who are like my my original Magic and Dungeons and Dragons yeah. friends, actually. That's sweet. Have set up a party, and so we're getting together and going through everything. I love that. I was just talking to my, my DM, who uh, has been playing on their own, but really wants to get a party together to yeah. start all over. Because they're like, look, I really appreciate that I could wander around and do all the missions that I wanted to do. But now I see people playing with other people, and all I want to do is have a party. It's it's so much fun. And I mean, the best part is that it, it kind of does feel like real Dungeons and Dragons. Like, we got to this point where we were running into like a group of druids. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we need to talk our way through this. And he was like, eh, <laughs> attack somebody. <laughs> and suddenly we're, we're fighting all of them. I'm like, no, what have you done? And he's like, it's done. It's happened. Too late. <laughs> Fighters, am I right? That's, and that's how I D&D play, real play really go. <laughs> Yeah, the word man, it's D and D is fun. I love playing a big dumb fighter because you're like, no consequences, smash. Yeah. <laughs> Hit with sword. <laughs> well, thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope you're having fun playing Baldur's Gate, uh, or I hope you're really excited about the Virtue and Valor precon because I really like this one. Oh, I definitely am. Before we go, big thank you to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Thank you to Damon Lentz, Eric Lem, Megan Yip, Garav Galati, Jamie Block, Arthur Metacroft, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Limberger, Ke- Craig Blanchett, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, Gabriel Pozos, Josh Lee Kwai, and Jimmy Wong. And of course, to you, Jordan Pridgen, for taking the time. Hey, thanks for having me. Good upgrade. Yeah. See you next time. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator.
Greetings, humans. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Great. Good job. Oh, boy. <laughs>